specific to the power infrastructure and on the future condition of Hurricane Sandy. This methodic can be also applicable to the Caribbean. Can we, what will happen to a future uh, Hurricane Maria in the, in the Caribbean? The intensity will be about the same over the path and how our critical infrastructure could be exposed to those level of uh, damages. So that's what I think that the academia can support in asking those harder, harder questions. And I will stop here. Yeah, thank you. So if you have a burning question, you can ask now, or you can hold your question when we come to the panel discussion. tsunamis. 
and earthquakes or hurricanes can, can generate a lot of landslides and you saw that we have very mountainous region. So uh, talking about the coastal uh, exposure, 44 of 78 municipalities along the coast of the people who live there, probably 1.7 million people live in coastal communities out of more than 3 million. So uh, actually 44,000 live in the floodway zones. You know, they, they flood every time. So uh, in terms of the built infrastructure, talking about residences, a lot of the residences in Puerto Rico are made of rainforest concrete. And for hurricanes, that's pretty good because they are heavy enough and strong enough that the winds won't uh, cause collapse on a rainforest concrete building. But some of them are built on hills and on slender columns, and those are in danger of landslides or in danger of earthquakes uh, that could generate landslides. So that's uh, one of the problems that hasn't been looked that much into. We have been looking at that at the university, but Hurricane Maria didn't do any damage to those. So uh, that is being like a look over. Uh, so uh, just one slide about earthquakes, because I work on that. But also, no, last month, we have a category six right here and generated hundreds of aftershocks. Uh, not too big, 3.5, 3, but the, just a reminder, because the 6.0 was felt over the whole island. Uh, about 101 years ago, we had a 7.5. More or less around that area, until 118 people. It generated tsunami, generated fires. So earthquake should not be forgotten. Uh, but talking about uh, other hazards, uh, this is a plot of the historic riverine floods in Puerto Rico. And down here is the flood prone areas. And you can see there's a considerable area of the island that is very prone to flood. And that has been worked on, but there's still a lot to do. Uh, talking about landslides, usually this is a combination of a lot of rain and the topography, but the winds can accelerate it and earthquake can accelerate. And uh, uh, so this was a big problem during the hurricane, I will mention more about that. So let's talk a little bit about Hurricane Maria. This was the preliminary track by NOAA. And I just plot this to show you the wind speeds. This is as it was approaching the island. It, it had 155 miles per hour, category 4 or 5. And uh, it continued, and then we don't have many measurements after that because we have two problems. The wind anemometers broke and the radar broke. So the last radar picture was <coughs> this one. And that's just as it was going into Yabucoa. And that we didn't, didn't get any more. We have satellite pictures. Uh, and uh, this is what happened in the major rivers. See, uh, uh, maybe you cannot read it, but the last column is the rank compared with historical peaks. And you see, three of them had their highest uh, inundation. Four more had the set, uh, five more had the second highest inundation. Then this is three, and this is four. So. Most of the major rivers had a major event all over the island. And uh, this is the wind. The maximum wind gust actually measured was over here in Culebra. And uh, these are the major wind gusts that were measured in other places on the island. 
but those instruments fail before reaching the peaks. So the, you can assume the winds were higher than those in those regions. Uh, <clears throat> so I can mention some of the infrastructure impacts. I won't go into all of them, but I will mention a bit about coastal flooding, our landslides, bridge failures, and just mention communications and, and the power grid, mostly because of the, the logistical breakdown that produced because of this combination of failures. Uh, <coughs> talking about coastal erosion, this is in Rincon. See, this, these buildings have been built like 30 years before, and when they were built, there was more than 100 feet of sand in front of them uh, before reaching the sea. And this didn't happen all at, at, at one time. Uh, there, there have been a lot of coastal erosion before the hurricane, but at the end, see, they, these were some of the few reinforced concrete structures that failed during the hurricane. And it's not a per se a, a failure of the structure, but it's a failure of the foundation, mostly because of the erosion under it. And uh, that's what happened also because of the landslides. Uh, these are also examples of coastal flooding. This was in Mayagüez, combination of the coastal flooding with the river in, uh, uh, flood. And this was in Mayagüez also. And you see, it, is, it looks pretty bad. <clears throat> Some of the estimated rainfall from uh, National Weather Service, you can see the peaks here. This is uh, data from September 19 to 21. It's actually about uh, 38 hours, something like that. Uh, and the maximum here was uh, 37 inches in that period. Uh, see, the storm came in through here, so it's not uh, difficult to imagine that these, these areas were higher impacted. But uh, most of the island was impacted. See, this uh, lighter uh, green is already 10 to 15 inches of rain. So that's, that's pretty big event. <coughs> and so that is what it brought. It brought flooding all over the island uh, that lasted uh, many hours. Uh, <coughs> talking about landslides, this was very common in the mountain regions. Uh, we got a lot of landslides, so the road had to be closed. And that was one of the problems with the trying to help people in the mountainous region. They were incommunicated because of the landslides or because of all the debris that fell on the road. Uh, in Colossal, look at this, this very expensive house. It's, uh, it's a shame. And uh, see, we tend to build a lot very close to the, to the mountain, so uh, there, there are many houses on that. The first estimates of USGS, <clears throat> there were, uh, they did this with uh, a, <coughs> a, with uh, aerial photographs, and uh, uh, they estimated about 40,000 landslides that I, I understand the latest estimate has been raised to 70,000 of all manuals, you know, small and big. And Utuado alone, here in the circle, they estimated 13,000, just in that municipality, 13,000 landslides. Uh, so uh, another big problem was the bridge failures. See, bridge failures uh, is a big combination of things. Some were very old. Many fail not because of the wind. I, I don't think the wind failed any bridges. It's the water that, after all the debris falls on the river and it gets uh, it gets to the bridge and it forms a wall, a 
And then the water is pushing on this wall. The bridge is not designed for that strong force. So sometimes the water will go above the bridge or on the side or erode the foundation or uh, just uh, get uh, be enough to wash away the road and then it's impossible. The estimates from the highway authority, they screen all 200 2,300 bridges. Out of those, uh, about 200 require additional visits. And out of those, 27% were severely damaged or collapsed. Out of the 200, and 63% moderately damaged. So the, some of the ones that completely collapsed, they have been replacing with these temporary bridges that uh, I'm afraid it might become permanent. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is what they are trying to do right away to be able to get some relief to these communities. And uh, for the bigger bridges, then they are in the design process. Uh, so the logistical breakdown, this, this is what everybody remembers actually, because, you know, there is, no telephone, no power, no fuel, no money. Uh, Banco Popular had to send people to bring cash from New York to, because there was, actually the ATM machines didn't work because there was no power, but also the banks didn't have enough cash. They limited the cash that people could go take out because they didn't have it. And, uh, uh, this is an ATM in San Juan that is probably working with a generator. And uh, the line for gas is uh, interminable. Three hours, four hours, five hours. Because people were looking for gas for the cars, but also for the electric generator. Uh, so that combined. And one thing that we probably learned at the beginning in the gas stations, they were limiting the amount of gas that people could take. Let's say, we can sell you $10, $20 max. Uh, but that meant that people would have to come back in, in two days. And the, the lines were forever. They, they, they didn't go out. So later they decided, we'll serve whatever person wants to serve until we run out of gas in the gas stations. And they ran out of gas. But uh, the lines started to decrease because people could wait a week, week and a half, come back, and then by that time, uh, transportation was better. So uh, this, these are more examples. Also, at the supermarkets, there were lines, but also, at the ice factories, because you know, if you need to maintain some food, coal, it's, it, it, it's, it's not like a commodity, it's just that it's not that the people wanted their drinks cold all the time. It's more like necessities. For example, if people need insulin, that has to be kept in uh, the refrigerator and so on. So these were long lines at the last battle. So telecommunication was a big surprise for me, because I figured the cell phones would continue working. <laughs> what Dr. Rafael Rodriguez will tell us in a moment, what happened. But uh, it was, I mean, people in the States were talking to each other and trying to reach the people in the island. We couldn't reach anybody. Only some landlines would work. Not all of them, but those old guns uh, save many people. And uh, the problem with the telecommunications too is the government couldn't even talk to each other. They couldn't coordinate really. And the power grid, you already saw some of this. This is uh, from July before the hurricane. This is 24 of September, <coughs> four days after the hurricane. This is the lights at night, only small places. 
Uh, so I think you already saw this for <laughs> But this is uh, the power grid. See, the power grid, it affected everything, but the, the debris was responsible for more, uh, a lot of the failure of the distribution system. Uh, so, what did we learn? Well, these are some examples. For example, we knew the critical infrastructure was compromised because of aging, because of lack of maintenance, and this was brought out to the attention by the heritage. Uh, it was in need of upgrades, and eventually we get it out of. Telecommunications were completely essential. And this probably doesn't take that much to make it better than what it was. Uh, the problem with the power grid failure will produce all sorts of other problems. Uh, engineer Joel Lugo, who was scheduled to be in this panel, was going to talk about the problems with water. Since he couldn't make it, I will just mention that uh, uh, they, they live with generators, but the, the first generators they have to put in the used water plants because that was the first priority was to treat the water so that it doesn't generate uh, diseases, right? And then the second uh, equally important priority for a water system is to bring uh, potable water to the clients and that took a bit longer uh, but they didn't have enough uh, generators they depend on the power for the pumps so uh, and they were uh, I, I hope Mr. Lugo was here because he I think he slept in the work office for uh, 40 something a month, a month. A month. A month he, did, he didn't go home trying to solve people. He, he's the director for the west, western part of the island. Uh, okay, so continuing here. This is one observation. See, we lost the radar. We lost the anemometers. Uh, even some of the seismic stations got damaged, but not that much. But uh, so, in order to learn from these events, to be better prepared, I think we, we need better observations, you know, better measurements. So, it's, if, if uh, you want to invest on learning for the future, one of the things is in investing on observation and recording systems. And, uh, Regarding reinforced concrete structures, I already mentioned that, but uh, there was a problem, no? Uh, there was a lot of construction on the island that wasn't built according to codes, and out of those, some were not built strong enough, and especially the lightweight structures and the wind to care of those. Uh, not of all, thank goodness, this is something that we learn from every disaster, that we are surprised from the, the structures that didn't fail, more than the ones that failed. Uh, so this is an example of the radar, this before and after, we, we was, it was blown out, and also some wind recordings, for example this in Fajardo, we only got a hundred, but see, it was racing right away. And this is also the same problem in Yabucoa, where the hurricane came in. Look, it was going up, it will continue to go up, but then we lost the other one. Okay? So, what can the university do? Well, uh, Dr. Gonzalez mentioned some. Uh, I think uh, our one of the major things we can do is capacity building. Right? So, uh, educating the people, the community, our students, our professors. This is what we do in the project for Coastal Resilience Center, but there's a big need to continue and do even more. 
Also, I mentioned the observation network deployment. Uh, we have good good networks. Uh, Sizeby networks seem okay. Caricus has a good uh, voice system that seems working good. But the anemometers uh, couldn't take the, the brunt of the hurricane. And uh, community support, oh, so the university and the community need to work together. That is, I think that's the major theme of this uh, whole conference, right? And the uh, university can do a good job of facilitating information. We have to put more resources into that. So, uh, with that, thank you for your uh, attention. And I can answer questions yet or later. They, they, in some of those, there were not some others there were, but they built them after the water reached uh, the buildings. Yes, yeah, so the erosion, erosion happened. in the recovery efforts, and that was uh, radio amp systems. That even though the modern communications failed, the older technologies were able to, to save a lot of people. And um, maybe we should take that also into further consideration. You have a, a, when new technology fails, all the technology tends to be a, a really solid backup. So we can do something with that. Thank you. Uh, so our third speaker is not here. Uh, just mentioned, I think he is in charge of the sewer stuff. But I will talk about water resources tomorrow when we have the um, second day panel. Our third speaker is Dr. Rafael uh, Rodriguez. So if you look at your program, your programs, and your name is there, now I was given the wrong bio. <laughs> so I only know uh, Dr. Rafael Rodriguez maybe a few minutes ago. So I have to read, I have to read from this description just a lot from his website. Uh, so Dr. Rodriguez is a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Puerto Rico, um, the US. And then his main research interest is wideband and tunable microwave and millimeter wave antennas and circuits. And then so he is a UPRMPI for the NOAA and OAA Cooperative Remote Sensing Science and Technology Center, the NOAA Press and director of UPRM's microwave and millimeter wave system laboratory. And there's lots of other information you can read from his website. Uh, so again, I apologize for the mistake. Uh, we have a mismatch of picture and the presenter. And so lack of bio of the right speaker. All right. That's what
AM radio stations that started in 1922, and I think after that, I will just point out here, in 1942, because of the service was not provide, provided in the eastern side of Puerto Rico by ITT, then the Telecommunications Authority was founded by the government. So we had two communications uh, systems at that time for phones in the, in the mostly east and central Puerto Rico, and then ITT which was, was all over the place after, uh, on the island. And uh, after that, uh, in 1974, the government decided to take over ITT and Puerto Rico Telephone Company is born. Uh, and in 1989, because of the equal access, guys are too young to know any of this, uh, because of the monopoly that was in the, in the US in terms of telecommunications, the local companies, uh, the, basically AT&T, they had to split out, split up, and they left only Local service for the and tele, long distance services have to be split. So in Puerto Rico, that affected the, the, the company also. So uh, a new company by the government was born at that time uh, to provide uh, local um, to provide long distance service. Um, finally, they decided to merge Puerto Rico Telephone Company and the Authority of Communications to sell them in 1997. Uh, so, when we think about, again about telecommunications, we think about mass communications. We have one emitter to many different people. So we will have radio, AM, and AFM. And FM. These are uh, and TV. And we have air, cable, and satellite. Um, and radio during Maria was. <coughs> So most of the problems, because you will see people lining up at the AM radio stations that were operating at the time to bring information about their, uh, about their loved ones, we are okay, they're safe. So we have people just waiting there in the uh, local AM stations to try to let them know, to let their uh, loved ones know that they were okay because there was no way uh, to communicate at all. Way. There was no power, so you cannot see your TV. So it, you have basically batteries to listen to a radio. Um, you have also point to point services. So this is mostly now voice. So you have, uh, and you, although now we have a lot of uh, data uh, availability to the mobile system. So you have radio again, shortwave radio, as uh, is all the information here. And then you have your telephone, fixed and wireless. You have basically family mobile basically wireless and satellite. So we have fixed telephone systems that are wireless and uh, the, the um, wireless companies will send you, you can skip in your home and your, and your cell phone. And then we have the complete revolution that internet dropping. So now you have internet being brought up by your cable station, by your phone, by microwave systems, uh, which is fixed uh, at your home. By mobile, you can get this wireless, and you can get satellite. And this changed completely the way that we communicate now. To, that we can do now communicate by to someone, just one by one, one to one, or one to many. You can just go to Twitter and communicate to everyone in the world. So um, the telecommunication service providers have now have 